Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Seems to be a recurring theme that <coughs> I can't quite shake out of my spirit at the moment and I think it's very important and I think if uh, some of you could get a release in this tonight. Um, it comes from two little angles really and, and what I call what I want to say tonight is what's in a name. Um, there are at least four instances in the Bible of God changing a person's name. And uh, recognizing them for who they have become, not who they were. So you have Abraham who becomes Abraham. You have Jacob who becomes Israel. You have, you have Simon who becomes Peter. You have Saul who becomes Paul. And you have another instance which is Jesus who becomes Christ. All of these changes of name are indicative of the fact that those people are no longer what they were, but the name has been changed because of who they have become. It's important that they be called by a new name to reflect the new place to which they had come. For all of them, it came out of a struggle of one kind or another. Wrestling was involved, physical, mentally, and spiritually, but nevertheless, there was a change. And so I say that just to really support the issue that that we are changing our name as a church because of who we have become and who we are becoming, much like happened in the Bible, because I believe we have been on a journey of encounter that has brought us to a place where it's necessary that we note who we have become. But there is a personal question as well, because this applies to all of us in life, and the question is, who are you becoming? Every one of you is becoming someone... The question is, who is that someone who you're becoming? Do you even like that someone who you're becoming? Would you like to be someone else? Do you think there's anything you can do about who you are becoming? Or do you think it's a done deal that can never be changed? And really, if the truth be known, this question is at the root of of all our well-being. There, there has never been a time where mental health has been more pro prolific than it is now, and yet we have more stuff and more things and more self-help books and more aid and more information, and yet we have an increase of mental health and different mental health conditions being diagnosed all the time that we don't even have names for, and now we put names on them but all of them are related to our inability to know who we really are and to deal with the issue of what we are becoming. The rate of teen suicide is frightening in the UK and it's all based around the pressure of who am I, who am I supposed to become, who am I becoming? And every week young people and adults take their own life because of struggling with this issue. Who are you becoming? Who's in control of who you're becoming? Well, the truth is some of you have given control of who you're becoming to someone else and to something else. For some of you, the power of who you are becoming rests in the fact that you have never dealt with who you were and where you came from and what your parents were like and what situation you were raised in. See, at the beginning of what would be a new direction in Jesus' life, the Gospels talk about an experience that Jesus had and that experience was him being led into the desert and, and in that experience in the desert, which you can read in Luke chapter 4, I'll read you two verses in just a moment, the primary obstacle thrown up by the devil, whoever the devil was, whatever the devil is, by the devil, this is how it describes it, it was to challenge his perception of his identity. There was a challenge to who do you think you are? Because if I can cause that to be defective, 
I can affect the whole course of your life. And that challenge comes in thousands of ways. It comes through peer pressure. Who do you think you are? And so many of you do what you do, behave how you behave, act the way that you act, simply because you want the approval of your peers, because you feel if your peers approve of you, you will approve of you, and if they like you, you will like you, and yet it never works. One of the problems with that is the pressure. That if you are liked because of what you do to please your peers then you're always wondering what must I do next in order to keep that approval from my peers and so your life is never your own, it always belongs to somebody else and you become shaped by those choices. Listen to me, it's far less important that others know who you are than that you know who you are. And we spend far too much time trying to impress onto others who we'd like them to think that we are when we've never resolved the issue in our own life, who we are. Once you've resolved who you are, you really don't care that much who other people think you are because you're at peace over who you know that you are. So those two verses in Luke chapter 4 and verse 1 and 2 said, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. He just had his baptism. At the baptism, he had an experience. In that experience, he made a discovery. The discovery that he made is that God really liked him. In fact, God liked him so much that God says, Hey, I don't know if you realize it, son, but I'm your dad. And if I'm your dad, you're my son. And if you're my son, I'm your dad. And there was this, this amazing moment of, of understanding for Jesus of who he really was and how that related to the divine and therefore what he could expect in his life. So he returned from that baptism and it says he was led by the Spirit in the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. I think that's amazing that Spirit would lead him into a desert. It's like, gee thanks, Spirit, that was very kind of you to lead me into this desert. But may I suggest to you that the reason for it talking about spirit leading Jesus in the desert is because if you don't fix this in the desert, you ain't going to fix it in life. So you're going to have to face it because if you don't face it, you won't fix it. So you have to be in a position where you face it. So the deserts of our lives, the time when we feel lonely, the time when we feel unfulfilled, the time when it's just not happening, actually could be more to do with the Spirit of God than the situation of life, because if you don't face it, you can't fix it. Now, what we don't want to do really is face it. We want to fake it and not face it. We want reality shows that are not reality, so we can pretend that that's reality, and then we can try to live in that reality and call it reality, when all the time we know it's not reality at all. We want to fake it rather than fix it. But the only way to know who you truly are and become secure in your own skin and to find your place under the divine, under God, in this world and purpose is not to fake it but to fix it. Now, I would dare to say there are as many people sat in churches like this on a weekend who are faking it as there are of fixing it, who know how to play the religious game because we always find how to play the game of the community that we happen to belong to. And we can look like we're supposed to look and sound like we're supposed to sound and do what we're supposed to do, but all the time faking it and not fixing it. Marriages that are unhappy, that look happy when we're sat together smiling in church. All of these things faking it, not fixing it. So, so the Holy Spirit himself, God's Spirit will lead you into deserts to help you to fix it and not fake it. And to fix it, you have to face it. But facing it is not pleasant, but face it is the way to fix it. So the way to deal with our identity issues is that we have to face them. So he was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Okay, Tempted by the devil, 40 days. All he can see is sand and more sand. Life's a beach. Might have crossed his mind. And for some of you, it crosses your mind just about every day. See, the challenge was, if you are who you think you are, prove it. If you're the Son of God, if you if you're the, command these stones to be made bread. In other words, the only way you can 
assure who you are is to try and prove it. Or in other words, you have to do stuff. But actually doing stuff never proves who you are. Doing stuff just proves that you're trying to, you're trying to influence somebody else to think that you are who you say that you are. Because if you are who you say you are, you don't have to be doing stuff to prove it. So Jesus was led into the desert to show how important it is to deal with the question, what or who is defining my identity? So I'll put that question to you tonight. What or who is defining your identity? It's a very important question. It's an important question because for some of you people who you don't even see, who are not even around, who you have nothing to do with, are defining your identity. For some of you it's things that happened, that divorce that happened, that relationship that broke down, that loss that occurred. Defining your identity. History Still defining your identity. Unless you deal with it, you won't fix it. Unless you face it, you won't fix it. But you've got to come into the desert where you face it in order that you can fix it. And in the desert, you're confronted with it, but you're confronted for a reason. Because the thing is, Jesus went into the desert facing the question, what and who is defining my identity? But he was also led into it to show how you come out of it. Which it goes on to say he came back in the power of the Spirit. Whatever happened, because he faced it, to fix it, meant that he came out with the power in his Spirit, not weakened, not undermined, but full of who he was in a confidence of that being. And some of you, until you fix that, you'll keep faking it. And until you face it, you won't fix it. You'll keep going into the desert until you resolve this question and can answer it with confidence. If you don't find your identity in something other than your history, you are heading for trouble. I've been in some of that trouble. There's been times when coming here has been for me like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And there's been times when it's been the rock on which I could anchor my life and my spirit. There have been times because my identity was connected to other people's thoughts about me that I have been crushed rather than helped, not because of their fault, but because of my unwillingness to face that I didn't know who I was, and therefore who I was had been determined by how many people was here. You know, we're growing again. We lost a few people. We're growing again. When we were at our biggest, I was probably at my most unhappiest. Because I was all the time worried about how do we keep all these people? How do we maintain this? How do I uphold my identity in this by not losing these people? So every little thing becomes a pain. So, so what appears to be success actually becomes unhappiness because outwardly it's there, but inwardly my identity was too tied into all of this and how well do I think I'm doing and, and are we being successful and what's going on? And, and all of us can be like that in whatever we do. you don't find your identity in something other than your history, you're heading for trouble. Jesus' response to the, what are called the temptations of the devil, three of them that were designed to undermine his confidence in who he was, was that it is written. Now, he wasn't trying to be some Bible basher. That's not, that wasn't the quoting text that the devil, you know, I mean, I've, everybody can do it. I've done that. I've been in religious circles long enough to know we've got a text for every equation, every occasion and, and every equation. And we can quote texts like an AK-47 assault rifle. But Jesus wasn't trying to quote texts. When he said it is written, it was a declaration that his identity was rooted in something beyond himself and something beyond this world. So there are two aspects to our identity. It must be rooted in something beyond yourself, but it also must be rooted in something beyond this world. Because if you're rooted in something beyond yourself in this world, that is as temporal 
as the situation you were in before. And guess what? People let you down. Situations let you down. Life changes. Friends that you thought you would be with forever suddenly decide they don't want to be with you because you don't give benefit to their life anymore so they don't understand friendship. So if you only root your, your, your identity in something beyond yourself but it's temporal... You've only put a temporary fix on the problem. So you've got to not only do it beyond yourself, but you've also got to set that identity beyond this world, in God, in the Father, in the Father's love, in the Jesus of the Gospels. Not necessarily the Jesus of religion. I'm giving you the right not to choose the Jesus of religion, the Jesus of the Gospels, the Jesus of Abba, the Jesus who loved his enemies, the Jesus who did something greater in his success than Adam did in his failure, that Jesus. So if you have not yet resolved this issue, please don't be mad at everybody. Because when we haven't resolved the issue of our own identity, we have an awful tendency to be mad at other people. Like somehow it's their fault. And if only people did this, and if only people didn't do that, please don't be mad at everybody, because the issue is Jesus was taken alone into the desert because the issue was in his heart, and that's where the issue is. The issue is in your heart. So who is the devil that they face there? I used to just read that and think, you know, there was the devil, obviously, he didn't have pitchfork and horns, but I liked the Ewan McGregor film, um, Last Days in the Desert, where, where this lonely figure's walking across the desert and he sees a man approaching him, and as the man gets nearer, he realizes it's himself. So in that movie, whether it's, whether, it's, whether it's theologically correct, doctrinally correct or not, I think there is some massive truth in it that in the movie, it, it, it was giving room that could it be that the greatest devil we ever face, the greatest challenge to our identity and who we are, is actually ourselves. I don't fear some mythical, spiritual creature. I'm much more frightened of me than I am of any devil, any demon, any spirit, any ghoul, any goblin. I'm more frightened of me because there's more devil can come out of me than ever can come out of those. And the devil that can affect me is often the devil that comes out of me. Now, you know, you know devil is, is a slanderer, right? That's what a devil is. It's a slanderer. It's somebody who speaks wrong of you. Devil is an accuser. Satan is an accuser. Those words have connotations that we can be the worst devil that we will ever face in the desert of our life. And if we can face down ourselves and the issues that we have in our lives, then the grace of God touches us and brings us out of that desert in the power of the Spirit. So who you are and who you think you are will have a far greater impact on your well-being than anything you will ever do. I think Chris was right last week about the self-editing that goes with the fear that others won't like who you are and will withhold their love. And we're trying to assess those things often in order that we might be in the right place. But let me give you three things that are important. Do never fixes who. Do never fixes who. We think the way to fix who we are is by what we do. But do never fixes who. Do makes you tired. Do makes you weary. Do makes you, makes you, makes you, um, uh, um, makes you disappointed. Do makes you disillusioned. But do never fixes who. You don't fix who by more do. Here's the second one. Have never fixes who. Because some of you still think, if I have more money, if I have a better qualification, if I have a better job, if I have a husband or a different husband or a wife or a different wife, if I just have another relationship, if I just have more of this, if I just have, that somehow it will fix who you are. But all it will do is leave you poor. And you'll find you've spent all your money and your energy so that you could have something that never fixed the problem, which is the who. For all of us, our peace does not rest in what we do or what we have. 
Our peace rests in who we are. And when discover who you are, then you have the peace. So do never fix us who, have never fix us who, who fixes you. When you know who you are, it fixes you. Jesus had an amazing thing happen, being born human, when he was baptized, because when he knew who he was, it's like his life exploded into the supernatural. Jesus never did a miracle before that. He hadn't preached a sermon, he hadn't done a miracle. It was nothing of the things that we read to associate with Jesus up to that point of him being baptized. When he was baptized, he discovered who he was because God said, I'm your father, I love you, I'm pleased with you. And once he knew who he was, then something changed in his life. Once you know who you are, and I would say, put that outside of the dimension of this world, No, once you know who you are to God, then you will know who he is to you. And once you know that, that's when the peace can begin because you're fixing the thing in the right place. Okay. I told this story the other week. Some of you haven't heard it. I'm riding home with Riley in the car. And uh, he's confused over, you know, where's my mummy? Where's my daddy? Where's grandma's mummy? Where's grandma's daddy? And who are they? And why are they great, great this? And, and then he's, he's figuring out that, you know, uh, who are, I am, I am mummy's daddy, but I'm his granddad. Grandma is mummy's mummy, but she's Riley's grandma. So I'm explaining to them this to him. So I said, so do you understand? I'm your mummy's daddy, but I'm your granddad. And he said, no, you're not. I said, no, yeah, listen, I'm your mummy's daddy. And because I'm your mummy's daddy, that makes me your granddad. No, you're not. Yeah, listen, right, let me explain one more time, okay? So we go through the whole thing. I'm mummy's daddy, so I'm your granddad. And he was getting very angry by this time, and he said, no, you are not. And I said, well, why, why? He said, you're not my granddad, you're my dad. No, because biologically, I'm not Riley's dad. But the truth is, I am to Riley who Riley believes I am to him. And the whole dynamic changes because I am to Riley who I believe, I, I am to Riley who he believes I am to him. And the truth is God is to you who you believe God is to you. Some of you have a severe God because you believe God is a severe God to you. And so that's all you can see and it's all that you get. But when you see the God, the Abba, the Father of Jesus as being the Father, the loving Father, the caring Father the nurturing father, when you see him for who he is, that is who he will be to you. Because it's all about identity. Now let me say a couple of things before I bring this to a close. First of all, living confidently in your own skin does not mean living arrogantly. Because some of you think, well, I know who I am. When the truth is you don't, you are who you think you are because you're kicking back against pain of life, against overbearing parents or or controlling leaders, and you think you know who you are, when actually you don't really know who you are, all you know is that you're not going to be that. And so what can happen is we, we don't live in our skin confidently, we live in our skin arrogantly. And we're a pain in everybody else's backside. Because there's no humility, no gentleness, no truth, because actually there isn't a confidence. When you have a confidence of who you are, it mellows the spirit, it brings peace to the heart. So living confidently in your own skin doesn't mean living arrogantly or narcissistically. This is also very important because narcissism is self-love. I love me and everything should happen because I really love me and everybody should love me like I love me because I love me and I'm so amazing and so love me. That's called narcissism and you've never discovered who you really are. You're heading for the desert once or twice, right? By the Spirit, to have an encounter, to fix it. So the truth is, when we are live confidently in our own skin, it doesn't mean living arrogantly, it doesn't mean living narcissistically, it means living peacefully, because actually you've got nothing to prove. You can live at peace with yourself. If you still think you've got something to prove, you haven't resolved who you are. So God is very interested in who you believe you are, and helping you to find the place where you know who you are, which the two might be different things, but God is, God is here to help you just like he was with Jesus. 
Because the wonderful thing about this encounter that Jesus had, where he knew he was the Son and where, and where he knew God was the Father, once he knew who he was, the interesting thing is when you know who you are, you know what to do. So I'm not striving anymore about what am I supposed to do with my life? What am I supposed to do? For those of you who've been in church, what's the will of God? Have I missed the will of God? Do I know what the will of God is? How do I find the will of God for my life? Because God never said to Jesus, okay, Jesus, now listen to me. This is what you've got to do. He said, listen to me, Jesus. This is who you are. And once he knew who he was, he knew what to do. Just look at his life. When he knew who he was, he knew what to do. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do, and the striving will stop. Okay, one more scripture and a comment, and then we're done. In the Old Testament of the Bible, in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, and verse 9 and 10, there is this interesting little thing that is just, it just seems totally out of place. If you read it in its context, it's like we've got all these genealogies, and it's like, and then all of a sudden, boom, this is dropped in, and then we just go back to the mundane. It's like, it just is the weirdest thing. But I'm guessing it's because you couldn't pass this guy's name without drawing attention to it. And there is a significance as to why. So here's what it says. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. So Jabez's name literally means bringer of pain. The one who causes pain. So his mother named him according to what he had done to her. So her experience was imposed upon him in the form of his name. So he always carried with him the pressure, the difficulty, the problem of his history that he was living because he never discovered who he was. But he had a, a moment of awakening. It says, verse 10, So Jabez cried out to the God of Israel. Now I find that interesting that it should be the God of Israel. Because the God of Israel is interesting because Israel is the one who was called Jacob. And when God visited Jacob and had a wrestling match with Jacob, God said, I'm going to change your name. And I'm going to change your name from Jacob, which means supplanter or cheat, to Israel, which means prince with God. So Jabez didn't cry out to the God of Jacob which was his heritage, he cried out to the God of Israel because he knew if Jacob could get his name changed, if he could become a different person, if his identity could be revolutionized, then so can mine. And the God of Israel is still here to change identities. The God of Israel is still here to fix identity problems, to resolve the issue of who you are. And so he said to the God of Israel, all oh, that you would bless me, and enlarge my territory, and let your hand be with me, and keep me from harm, so that I will be free from pain. I love this, and God granted his request. Like, I was waiting for you to realize that you don't have to be defined by your history. That who you are does not have to be the consequence of who people wanted you to be. Who you are is what you discover when you step outside of yourself in this world, but then outside of yourself in the divine, and suddenly you find that the God of Israel, the one who changed Jacob to Israel, is the one who changes you to become someone who you were always supposed to be. So how Jabez, who Jabez saw himself to be without a change was a person defined by someone else's pain and struggle. How many of you see yourself as a person defined by someone else's pain and struggle. And you've never got free. Whether you're 16, 20, 25, 55, 75. He saw himself to be without, without, without a change. Jabez saw himself to be without a change. He was a person defined by someone else's pain and struggle. He evidently felt that he was not blessed. He actually felt that he was trapped. Please enlarge my boundaries. I'm stuck here. I'm imprisoned. I'm trapped by this stuff. That he was confined and couldn't move on and couldn't move out. He couldn't see a helping hand because he said, Hold oh, let your hand be with me. He felt it in arm's way because he said, Keep me from arm. And he felt that pain was his portion because he said, I want to be free from pain. 
Some of you think that who you have become right now is all that you can ever be, but actually who you have become is a reaction to and not a repairing of the damage that has been done to you. My heart today is that there will be a repair of the damage, that there will be a transition, that the God of Israel who changed Jacob to Israel, a prince with God, will change you from being who you have become as a result of the pressures of never having faced the question of who you really are to become who you are always supposed to be so that under the Father, as His Son in this world, you will know what to do. Because the wonderful thing is here that out of the recognition of what had been defining His life to that point, He cried out to God, And God granted his request. Out of the recognition of what had been defining his life up to that point, he cried out to God and God granted his request. Can you see the pattern? Out of the recognition of what had been defining his life to that point, he cried out to God and God granted his request. Therefore, out of the recognition of what has been defining your life up to this point, as you cry out to God, He will grant you your request. And I believe there's freedom from many of you in here. None of us are exempt from this. I stand here and preach because I have to deliver. I have not been exempt from this. I still have those deserts. And I face the devil of self in there who is trying to undermine my identity in God and in Christ. And he's doing that for you. But my encouragement to you tonight as we just pray is that you will recognize what has been defining your life to this point and cry out to God. And I believe God will grant your request. Bow your heads for one moment. If that's you, I'm not going to put words in your heart. I'm not going to put words in your mouth. But I think it would be a good idea for you right now, just quietly in your spirit, just to have that conversation with with God, the Father of Jesus, the God of Israel, the God who changes names, the God who frees us from faking it so that we can fix it, the God who helps us that when we face it, we can fix it. So he's helping you to face it. Those struggles are because he's helping you to face it. But in facing it, you have to make that recognition of what has been defining your life and cry out, oh God, today, please bless me, enlarge my territory, Let your hand be with me. Keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain and so that you can walk out of that place in the confidence of knowing tonight who you are. And when you know who you are, you have peace. And in that peace of knowing who you are, you know what to do. There's healing for your heart tonight if you will receive it. So Father, right now, I just pray that that healing that comes from you by your Spirit into our humanity and supernaturally transforms us that connects to our journey but changes us brings that change that we can't do in the natural but brings supernatural transformation so that we don't just change name in the natural from a Jacob to an Israel but we change from a cheat, a supplanter from a disappointed one from one who's full of pain to an Israel a prince with God, to an Abraham, one who's fruitful for many things, to a Paul, who's a solid place, to a Christ, who's the anointed, gifted one of heaven. I pray for that change tonight, Father. I release it in this house. Pray by your Spirit. Do what only you by your Spirit can do. As hearts in here recognize what is defined their identity. But tonight, I want you to grant the request. Heal the hurt. Fix the wound. Open the eyes. Lift the spirit. Bring back the light. Bring back the hope. And release the future that you have called us into because you call us by a name that comes from your lips to ours that lets us know we belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, be blessed. We love you. We appreciate you. And we're going to pay it forward, be ready to give. And uh, and that's it. Thanks for watching. 
You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others. <laughs>